All right, what you doing? All right. There we go. Hey, good That's evening. It. All right, go on mute. Can y'all hear me? Can I be heard better now? Yeah, I, don't... yeah, I can hear you, brother. I'm going to see you on the, on the chat, but I can hear you now. Hold okay. on. Go on mute. Can y'all hear me? Can I be heard? Just tell me yes. We can get this started. Alan, and that one of y'all just tell me yes, y'all can hear. Somebody? Hello? You good, bro. You good. Hold on, hold on. We good? Yes? No? Let's go. Pete, Centavo, Kansu, uh, Tamika, can y'all hear me? All good? All right, let's rock and roll. All right, so I want to apologize for the technical difficulties that we had. I want to thank all of y'all for joining us for this presentation. Uh, like I mentioned previously, I'd like you to just grab a piece of paper and a pen too and just jot down some things. If you have some questions or um, just something that you might want to do further research on. I ask that you please, um, if your children are of age and around, please grab them and have them sit down and enjoy this presentation uh, together. What I will ask is at the end of this presentation, if you have found this information useful and insightful, to please help us on our mission and get this into school curriculums. This is not just for presentation sakes, this is I hope will lead to us actually beginning to change uh, the history books for our children and include our stories that have been uh, missing from history. So with the, yes, it will be done each day. So I, I'm gonna be off and on looking at the chat, but I have my brothers look at the chat. This particular presentation off the bat, I wanna say is dedicated to two brothers in particular, Dehudi and MBK because they're the ones who, uh, I guess, brought me in to the fold, in a sense, and um, took interest in ways that I presented information. So uh, this one is for you two and the rest of my um, MBK brothers and sisters. So with that said, uh, let's go. All right, this presentation is entitled Intro to the Africans of New Amsterdam. And New Amsterdam is New York City. The years 1625 to 1664, those are the years that um, uh, New Amsterdam existed. And this presentation is with complete proof. So with that said, we have over 100 slides to try to get to. I'll try to get to as many as I can, but let this uh, process begin. First, first we'll start with a man named Jan or John Rodriguez. Now, I will make this claim and then proceed to prove it. John Rodriguez, or John Rodriguez, was an international weapons dealer, the first non-native resident of New York City, and he was a black rascal. Let's take a further look to see what I mean and how. Once you hear these things and I present the evidence and you see they are backed up with fact and are validated, you too should feel comfortable making a statement and future statements in this uh, particular broadcast just like this. It may seem outrageous, backed up with 100% fact. So, uh, somebody go on mute. Jan Rodriguez was an explorer of African descent. He was born in Santa Domingo, which is the Dominican Republic. Uh, somebody please go on mute. Uh, in 1613, he traveled with the Dutch ship from Dominican Republic to New York to participate in the beaver trade. That's right, the beaver trade and beavers will be throughout this broadcast, so pay attention. This is the epic true story of exploration and independence. Juan Rodriguez, a someone who was called a black rascal, is the soul of New York City. Now, what do I mean by that? This right here is the actual Dutch record uh, from a court case explaining who Juan Rodriguez is. This is vital and important information because this is the primary document and actually the only source that we have on who Juan Rodriguez not only was, but what he did. Remember I said, and stand by, international arms dealer, 
and a black rascal and explorer. So we will begin to read. This is the exact translation of the Dutch document that we just saw. I will read this. This the first part of this presentation. We will have some reading to get through, but I'll try to fly through it as fast as we can. Today, the 20th of August in the year of 1613. Uh, where's the little pointer thingy so you can see where my uh, here it is. Uh, appear before me, etc., at the instance and request of Captain Adrian Block, citizen of the said city, yada, 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 that is true that the deponents sailed to the last voice. The said Mossel ship, Tejas Mossel was the uh, captain of the ship, arrived in the river of New Nova, Virginia, which is the Hudson River. Finally, they declared that when the said Mossel sailed away from the river with his ship, this is the actual Dutch court case now, word for word. A mulatto born in Santa Domingo who arrived there with the ship of San Masu stayed ashore at the same place. They had given this mulatto 80 hatchets, some knives, a musket, and a sword saber. The said Tejas Masu and his supercargo then themselves declared that this Spaniard had run away from the ship and gone ashore against their intent and will, and that they had given him the said goods in payment of his wages and therefore had nothing more to do with him. Moreover, they testified, said that the crew of the plaintiff ought to have killed, shot him, seeing that he had declared that he would not come to this country of Holland and that he would have jumped overboard if they had not allowed him to depart. The dependents declare also to have knowledge that nobody of the said Mossel's crew stayed assured in the said Virginia other than the Spaniard. Now, I said he was the first non-native resident of New York City. I just showed you how when the explorers came, he had a fight and refused to go to Holland. They paid him with hatchets, knives, musket for trade with Native Americans for beaver, mind you. And he stayed in New Amsterdam, making him the first resident of New York City. Let's go on. This is the continuance of that said court case. And which you can find in the Dutch records of, of Juan Rodriguez. This is actual Dutch writing here. And this is the translation. Once again, I'll try to get through this as soon as quick as possible. But this is the actual court case. This is what was said. This is what's on the historical record. We, the said witnesses, jointly deposed to be true that when Hans Jurassen or Tejas Marshall's sloop came up to Mary's ship, to May's ship from Horn, the same sloop remained lying there next to May's, yada, yada, yada. And who were appointed to see and check sell on the goods? Dirk Clayson Clays and Franz Johnson both declare it to be true that Juan Rodriguez, who was in the producer's service and who was on shore with certain trading goods, some of his cargo for trade, fired a shot. Yes, Juan Rodriguez was a bad dude, and he fired a shot at the people who had came back to disrupt his business. Uh, there were after the witnesses jumped all five into the boat with five men and went ashore, rowed to shore in a hurry, unarmed without thought of the difficulty or danger. As soon as they came ashore, there they saw that many members of Mossel's crew, of whom Hans Jorsen was the leader foremost, almost immediately followed, came with their boat, leaving the mess, armed with muskets and burning matches. They also went ashore where four members of their crew immediately attacked. Juan Rodriguez. They took away his musket, drove him in the water, and arrested him by force. Then they said, here we go, Juan Rodriguez took the sword saber away from one of the crew of Hans Jorosin, who held him. When they, the witnesses, saw this, this they witnessed, and they did their best to rescue him. They jumped in the water to get him, and they took the said Juan Rodriguez, who was injured, into their boat and rode to their ship. And when one of the witnesses then asked Hans Jorison why they should arrest and injure Jan Rodriguez, the said Hans Jorison answered, that black rascal, actually in the Dutch records, referring to the said Juan Rodriguez, here's some words on wanting, this is dealing with the transaction, in order to get the money due us. 
And the other day when the said Dirk bought the sword that Juan Rodriguez had taken away from Hans Jorison back to the ship, Cornelius Jacobs made, he saw Juan Rodriguez's musket, which they had taken. And um, the story, pretty much, that's the end of the story. That's on the actual Dutch records, the story of the first resident of New York City who was a black rascal, and we know he was a mulatto man, so he was African, and his father was likely a Spaniard, because they called him a Spaniard, was the first resident of New York City. He was also an arms dealer because they left him hatchets and muskets and sabers to trade with the Native Americans for fur. I stated to you that the first resident non-native of New York City was a black rascal, an international arms dealer. And I think I've proven my case from the actual primary documents which state exactly that let's go on we don't need to go through this this is more of the end this, of the story. this is a court case right that's the actual court case from the dutch records and right. that can be found that's why i said just give me a second i know there's gonna be questions this is the book that you want to get it is juan rodriguez in the beginnings of new york city it was done by anthony stevens acevedo tony warings and uh Leonor Alvarez Francis. This was done by graduate students at the CUNY um, City College um, Dominican Studies Institute. And for further proof, in New York City from 159 to 218th Street along Broadway is named Juan Rodriguez Way. See the sign? So all my people in New York City are visit, look up from 159 to 218th on Broadway, it's Juan Rodriguez Way. Interestingly enough, why is this in Juan Rodriguez did not visit uptown Manhattan where this is located? This is located uptown because there is a high, heavily concentrated Dominican population. And once these students did this research and saw that he had a Dominican background through political influence, they got this area landmarked with Juan Rodriguez Way. This is the importance of knowing your history and it leading to landmarks and in turn political activism. So the Dominicans up there, they take Juan Rodriguez. We don't even know the story. But so for all those who want to find and see those exact Dutch records, this is the book that you want to get. And uh, this is the, one of the few jewels that I'll give you. If you search hard enough, you may be able to find this book online for free. Let's move on. Now, Henry oh, Hudson. Damn, you got to pause after that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, man. God damn. Yeah, we got a lot to get through. Uh, this is Henry Hudson. Now, Henry Hudson was an English sea explorer and navigator during the early 17th century, best known for his explorations of the United States. In particular, we know him, obviously, because we have the Hudson River. Now, in 1609, he landed in North America searching for the Northeast Passage. He worked for the Dutch East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and this is their flag right here. VOC in, in Dutch stands for Dutch East India Company. He sailed up the Hudson River, which is later named after him and thereby laid the foundation for the Dutch colonization of the region that sources Wikipedia. I use that because that's a general source where we can get general information about these people. He's not the main focus of our presentation. The reason that I bring him up now, he comes before Juan Rodriguez in 1609, and he doesn't find his North um, East Passage, but what he does bring back is beavers, and they had interest in that. So they said, okay, we'll look into the fur trade. Now, independent sailors start to come at this time, and, and amongst those groups, is where Juan Rodriguez comes just four years after Henry Hudson had come to New York City working for, because he was an Englishman, as we see, working for a Dutch company named the Dutch East India Company and their explorations. So that shouldn't be there. We'll keep going. This is the Dutch West India Company that we speak of. New York City was founded by a pirate company. The man who has run New York City the longest had a peg leg and owned the most Africans in New York City. I'm gonna let this stay here for about three to five seconds so you can see 
what I'm saying, and I mean every word in the statement that I just presented to you. And then I will proceed to present the evidence, evidence, excuse me, to show my case. So once again, New York City was founded by a pirate company. The man who has run New York City the longest had a peg leg and owned the most Africans in New York City. Let's go. The Dutch West India Company. Um, please, people who watch this who may be Dutch or no Dutch, I'm going to slaughter the language. I actually want to learn it or learn it better, but let me give it a try. Geo Triad West Indies Compagnie, right? So when you see these letters, these are the Dutch words for Dutch West India Company. This was their logo. Why are they important? So this man is named William Eusellenix. And in 1621, he founded a company named the Dutch West India Company. This is actually a picture of the Dutch West India Company house in the Amsterdam, in Amsterdam. And what I highlighted here is you can still see those letters that I talked about in this picture stating that this is the Dutch West India house. It actually says it up here, West Indies Heist, and that's in Dutch. He is the founder of the Dutch West India Company. So the Dutch West India Company was a chartered company, which means that it was a publicly traded company. It was it had a charter, like a charter school, right? Of Dutch merchants as well as foreign investors. On June 3rd, 1621, it was granted a charter for a trade monopoly in the Dutch West Indies by the Republic of the Seven United Netherlands, right? And given jurisdiction over Dutch participation in the Atlantic slave trade, Brazil, the Caribbean, and North America. This company was founded and was given, basically, <laughs> the Atlantic slave trade, Brazil, and the Caribbean, North America. This company founded New York City. Company. I'm going to keep stressing that. It was not a country. They were from a country, but it was a company that did it. This is the actual Dutch West India house in Amsterdam and it's still this today. Um, part of my initiatives as well is if I get the support, I'd like to go to uh, Holland and deliver this same lecture and many others that I have before you. So Dutch West India Company, this comes from the charter of the Dutch West India Company in 1621. You can find that at the Yale University site. Right. And we finally by experience that without the common help, assistance and interposition of a general company, the people designed from hence for those parts, the people going there cannot be profitably, profitably protected and maintained in their great risk from pirates, extortion and otherwise, which will happen in so very long a voyage going to those places like Africa or Brazil or the Americas. We have therefore, and for several other important reasons and considerations as they're unto moving with mature deliberation of counsel and for highly necessary causes found it good that the navigation, trade and commerce in the parts of the West Indies and Africa. This company was set up to exploit and take advantage of these regions in particular. Further goes on in their charter where we have therefore and for several other important reasons uh, and considerations as they're unto moving with mature deliberation of counsel and for highly necessary causes found it good that the navigation, trade, and commerce in the parts of the West Indies and Africa and other places hereafter described should not henceforth be carried on any otherwise than by the common united strengths of the merchants and inhabitants of these countries being uh, Holland. And for that end, there shall be erected one general company, which is the West India Company, which we, out of special regard to their common well-being, um, and to keep and preserve the inhabitants of those places in good trade and welfare. So I stated to you that after Henry Hudson, you had all of these other 
um, Netherlands shipping companies trying to get in and trying to exploit the beaver trade in, in this region. And they were having those fights, like the one we saw with the black rascal, the first resident of New York City, Juan Rodriguez. We, those fights were current. And so the decision was to give this company control of this particular area that would soon become an area known as New Netherland. And they was twofold in their reasons. It was multifaceted, but twofold in particular, as far as they wanted to interrupt the business that Spain and Portugal were doing in the new world. And they wanted to keep an eye on what England was doing because they had a few years prior set up an establishment known as New England and the Virginians. The Dutch were at competition with England and at war with Portugal and uh, Catholicism because they were breaking away from it. So now with this, we can see in their charter where they built forts for slave trade in Africa and the West Indies, the Dutch West India Company. Further, None of the natives or inhabitants of these countries shall be permitted to sail to or from the set lands or to traffic on the coast and countries of Africa, from the Tropic of Cancer to the Cape of Good Hope, nor in the countries of America or the West Indies, but in the name of this united company of these united Netherlands. I will stress to you once again that a company, the Dutch West India Company, which was a private company, founded and controlled New Amsterdam until 1664, a company called Dutch West India Company. Now, I have some disputes with academics. That's why I hope that they uh, see this video at some point. The, um, the somewhat uh, leaders or experts in this field, I have um, had an argument with uh, or a discussion with about the use of pirate versus privateer. And then briefly, I will state that the only difference between a pirate and a privateer is a permission slip. And that permission slip is called a letter of mark. If you look at the top of your maker's mark bottle, you will see a burning candle. That's what they made the seals with on the letters of mark. And so when you have a letter of mark or a permission slip from a country, you are able to go and pirate ships of other nations and what have you. And it's OK because you're a privateer. Now, when you lose that right to do it, the country stops sponsoring you, but you still continue those activities. Then you are a pirate. So Captain Kidd at one point was a pirate. He became he was also a privateer because he worked for some of these companies. John Hawkins, the one that people know from slavery, was a pirate. But when he started to doing stuff in the name of England and getting getting letters to do this for England, he became a privateer. Same actions he took, same kidnappings, thefts, murders, and robbers. So I present and I state again the people that you can contact are Charles Gehring, G E H R I N G. He is the leading official in this particular area. And also Russell Shorto, who wrote the book Island at the Center of the World. And also you can contact the New Netherland Institute. And if you want the other people who are the officials and aficionados, I can give them to you and I will have to discuss this discussion with any of them. So let's go on. So with that said, the, with this West India Company built the colony of New Netherland, which extended from Connecticut to Delaware, and New Amsterdam, which is New York City, became its main city. So this right here is the seal of the Providence of New Netherland. This was done in 1623. And at the center of it lies what? A beaver showing you what the money was and what the purpose was. This right here is the first seal of New York City at the time it was called New Amsterdam. And you can see the date, 1654. You can see the letters right here of the Dutch West India Company. This, these X's, and when it's, this is color, this is the flag of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And sitting atop of it is the beaver. Is this beaver right here showing you that the reason that New York was even New York was because of fur. I didn't tell you why initially, but fur was valuable because it was cold and it is cold in places like the Netherlands. And they did not want to get 
uh, hijacked by prices that Russians were charging for fur. So they found another outlet to exploit, which was New Netherland. So this was money. It's like a dollar sign sitting up here. To them, this was it. Let's go on. This is a map of New Netherland. And um, I, I don't know if you can, guys can see that clear. I should have highlighted more so. But this is a map of New Netherland from the uh, 1600s, 1700s. This is Long Island right here. And Manhattan is in here. Hopefully you can see where my uh, uh, highlighter is moving. And somewhere on here, I didn't put the part, but there's beavers to show you, like the times turkeys, and to show you type of animals that this showing lived here and what have you. But this <laughs> is the proposed seal for a new um for the colony of Am uh, New Amsterdam, which is New York, showing you once again. It's the other one in color, beavers, the Dutch West India sign, and. This is the flag of the city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. This was New York's proposed seal in 19, uh, 1630. And you can find this at the New York Historical Society. Let's go. So, Fort Amsterdam. Some of the trading and slave forts that the West India Company named Amsterdam. Why? Because the West India Company was founded in Amsterdam in Holland after the city was founded. So let's take, a, let's take a look at Fort Amsterdam. There we have Fort Amsterdam in Cormantine, West Africa, showing the Dutch presence in West Africa. Cormantine is the Ghana region of the Gold Coast, and you see the flag atop. Sometimes you may see the flag in red, white, and blue. The colors of the Dutch flag at one point changed from uh, orange, white, and blue to red, white, and blue. But for the most part, they had orange, white, and blue. So this is why you'll see the distinction sometime in the two. They also had a Fort Amsterdam in St. Martin in the Caribbean. Hopefully you can see where the highlight is moving. This is Fort Amsterdam there. So they weren't even that creative. Let's continue. They also have a Fort Amsterdam that you can go and see in Curacao. There's the flag, orange, white, and blue to this day, still flying at Fort Amsterdam, representing that West India Company. So we got Africa, the, the Caribbean, Curacao, we have this Fort Amsterdam. Oh, what do we have here? We have a Fort Amsterdam in New York City. That is this highlight right here, right here, this um, diamond looking thing. And over here, you have what? This is a map, this is an actual map from the, um, from, from New Amsterdam from 1660. This is an actual historical map. Right here is the wall for Wall Street. Yes, there was an actual wall on Wall Street. This is Broadway right here. There's the broadest street. Under the Dutch, it was named the Herstraat. And for the Native Americans, they called it the Wick Kwaskek Trail because this is why Broadway leads to the whole island. The Native Americans, for the most part, did not live down this area. They were seasonal. So they would come down Broadway during the season and do what they did, burn down everything, because that was their way of uh, re trying to replenish the land, and then march up all the way back uptown to where they lived at the end of the island, for the most part. So when it came to trade of beavers, they would come down with their beavers and right down Broadway and come to Broadway and to the fort and trade their beavers for trinkets. Or vice versa, they're taking the trinkets, leaving the fort, which sits at, in the beginning of Wall Street, down by the bull, down by you know the business center, right there. So the Wick built a fort at the tip of Manhattan with African labor. Yes, Africans built this fort. Lenape, who were the Native Americans, used this trail to her drought, like we mentioned, to sell and trade beaver. Now, Broadway runs north and south through the entire borough of Manhattan. That's why it's an important street, but we can see that the Native Americans made this vital way before um, the European comes. So, ironically, today, at the site of the former Fort Amsterdam is the Museum of the American Indian. You see how, like, we gotta learn these secrets. There's dirty tricks going on here. They put a museum of the Native America at the same spot 
that was responsible for basically elimination of Native American is the museum for them. And it's the former site of Fort Amsterdam. How do I know this? Here's your evidence. When you walk up these stairs and you go inside this building, this plaque is here. This plaque reads the site of Fort Amsterdam built in 1626. Within the fortifications was erected the first substantial church edifice on the island of Manhattan and yada, yada, yada. This site, not this building, this site <clears throat> is the site of the former Fort Amsterdam. So we have a Fort Amsterdam in Curacao, one in West Africa, one in the Caribbean, and one in New York City all run and maintained by the Dutch West India Company. Here's another shot from the Castillo plan. You need to look this up if you're interested. It's an old map from 1660. And I just want to zoom in to show you a better um, uh, idea of what the fort at the beginning of Manhattan looked like. And flying right above it is the Dutch West India Company flag, Fort Amsterdam. New York City, run by the Dutch. And even further, so the flag of the West Indian Company, like I mentioned, flew over various forts they controlled in Africa and the Americas. It also flew proudly in New York City. So when you take the family to Epcot, to Disney World, they have the Epcot American Adventure, and they have an area called the Disney Corridor of Flags. In that, is all the old flags of different countries that laid some claims into sections of America throughout historically. And look what we have here. The West India Company flag is right there. And she can, right there, right? It's telling you the story that we don't know about these guys. Responsible, major was part of our enslavement and besides the foundation of, of New York. But yeah, right here. This company, kidnappers and pirates in Epcot, go to the corridor of flags. All these are historical flags. And it's just, I'm showing this slide to prove my point that this is not just mumbo jumbo. This is real. Let's go on. So this is the flag of, New Netherlands, of the Netherlands in Holland from 1572 to 1795. It's the flag of the Dutch West India Company. Get it? This is the secret. This is the flag of New York City. <laughs> this is the tricolor flag. Same colors as the flag uh, denoting the origin of that company and that country. And the symbols in this flag give clues to the history. Let's take a closer look. These are the symbols in that flag. This is the seal of New York City. This is the sailor. The sailor represents the Dutch explorers. They're funny, in heraldry, which is this type of uh, stuff that we're looking at, this position in heraldry is called Dexter. This position right here, who represented by the, the Lenape, is called Sinister. It's messed up, right? So when he discussed this, they mentioned that Dexter is this, and the Native American is named Sinister. On this seal, their actual names are Dexter and Sinister. In the middle, we have something here. This is the actual New York City seal. Why do we have two beavers here? Going back to the importance of beavers as money and the establishment of America, of, excuse me, of New York and what it was made for. And the windmill also represented industry and some other Dutch. There's other stuff behind what this could represent is the St. Andrew's Cross, the same X's that are on the Amsterdam flag, but we can go into that later. 1625, you find it's not the exact date. It changed on the seal, and it's all somewhat of an arbitrary date because of when at New York, New Amsterdam was actually purchased and when. Anyway, this is an arbitrary date. And you can go ask any New York historian or historian, and they'll tell you the same thing. But that's not the main focus of this, although 1625 would be an important date for us in this presentation. This is the flag of Manhattan. This is the flag of the Bronx. Anybody starting to see a theme here? This is all the secrets that we overlook. That, that I mean, people in the Bronx, Manhattan, New York, Idaho, whatever, who've seen these things don't really 
We're not taught to put these clues together. And if you teach your children these things, especially as far as New Yorkers are concerned, they'll understand the history of New York and see themselves in it by the end of this presentation. But with that said, when you ask your kid who founded um, New York, they can look up at the flag. This flag is in every city park and government building in New York. And he'll tell you, he or she will tell you the Dutch because they know those colors. And you'll ask them why, and they'll say because they came wanting some beavers, and he'll look at this same flag. And they'll ask you who they get the beavers from, and they'll see the Lenape on this flag. And now your kid will understand the history of New York and will have visual clues, but they'll never forget this information. This is the type of information in the ways that I am trying to encourage my team to get this information presented so that the children always have these reminders of history because it's all around them and in many cases it's free. So this is the flag of Manhattan. This is the flag of the Bronx, orange, white, and blue representing the country and the company that ran New York City. Huh. This is a map of the Netherlands. Let's take a look what we have on this map. On this map, we have a place called Harlem. This is in New York. This is the Netherlands. This is Amsterdam. We have a place called Harlem. There we go, right here. We have a place called Nordwick. I want people to remember this name. Write it down. This will come up later. Nordwick. I did it here for a reason. You also have a place called Amsterdam. Do we have a place called Amsterdam, New York? We certainly do. We have a place called um, Amsterdam Avenue in Harlem. We certainly do. There's a place in Amsterdam and Holland called Brooklyn. Huh. Do we have a place in New York City called Brooklyn? Yes, we do. Huh. Here's a place called Newkirk. Do we have a place called Newkirk in Brooklyn? Yes, we do. But this isn't New York that we're looking at. Oh, no, this is Holland and Amsterdam that we're looking at. The distance between Harlem and Amsterdam in Holland is roughly uh, 12 miles. Right? The distance between Wall Street, which was the center of New Amsterdam, and Harlem, New York, is 11.2 miles, roughly 12 miles, uh, roughly 11 miles, but give or take a mile. Huh, coincidence? But let's dig deeper. Towns in the Netherlands, like I mentioned, Brooklyn, Harlem, Amsterdam, Northwood. The people who control the Netherlands are called the Staten General. This is their logo. The States General. This is where we get the name Staten Island from because these are the people who actually ran the government and they pay tribute to them by naming that particular place, Staten Island, after the States General. Get it? Map of Netherlands. This isn't New York. This is, the, this is Amsterdam. Brooklyn, Harlem, Amsterdam, Newkirk. There's, there's tons of other ones, but I think you get the picture. Huh, New York sports teams. Here's my sports fans. Why do, the, why do the Islanders wear orange, white, and blue? Why do the Knicks wear orange, white, and blue? It is for the company that founded the city. They are representing the West India Company. Goddamn. <laughs> Goddamn. This right here is <laughs> for the Knickerbocker. This is actually the Knicks' first logo. I won't go into it too much, but knickerbockers were considered the Dutch businessmen. And they wore these knickers or shorter pants, like you see. And so you get knickerbocker from, it's from a famous book by Washington Irving, which I won't go into now. But anyway, knickerbocker. This is their logo. This is the Westchester Knicks, who is their, um, uh, what do you call them? They don't call them a D League team, but their other team. And who took the old father on Knickerbocker logo, but they still have the orange, white, and blue colors representative of, <laughs> that's right, the Dutch West India Company and how The state bird for New York is the Eastern bird. Notice anything about the colors on this bird? The state bird of New York? Orange, white, blue. The New York State bird is picked to represent the Dutch West India Company, the company that founded and ran New York City. Now, 
The Dutch West India Company eventually had something called patroons. Patroons were landholders who had manorial rights, or they were like the feudal landlords. And they were given large tracts of land in New Netherland. Uh, and they were given this thing called the Charter of Freedoms and Exemptions, which we'll go through. Um, and some of these patroons is a guy named Killian Van Rensselaer. Actually, he never even came to America. That's the crazy part of it. He never stepped foot in America. He owned most of Albany. And if you go upstate Albany, New York, you have Rensselaer County. And people who know about colleges know Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It was named after Rensselaer, who was a Dutch patroon for the Dutch West India Company and given this land. And Rensselaer, in fact, had the most enslaved Africans in New Netherlands. He basically owned all of Albany. That was his farmland, which they call Rensselaerwick. This is named man named Michael Paul. Michael Paul wasn't as uh, successful a patroon as um, Killian uh, von Rensselaer, but I put him in here because people in the area might know of a place in New Jersey called Pavonia Newport, right across the water in Jersey City, and that is named after Michael Paul. Don't believe me? Go to Newport, New Jersey, and look at the sign. The southeast of this spot, the Half Moon, which is Henry Hudson's ship, anchored here September 11th through 12th, 1609. Here, the community of Pavonia was established January 10th, 1630. This is important because here, the freedoms and exemptions given to, to patroons was given 1629. After they got this, they started populating this area with poor Dutch workers and Africans. And then they got into wars with Native Americans. There's a big war if you want to look up called the Pavonia Massacre, and you can see it. But um, just showing you that this is named after one of these Dutch West India Company directors. All of this stuff. Let's go on. So this, this freedoms and exemptions, what did it say? Okay, 1629, the wick ran the town and the beaver trade. The, the company ran it. And patroons were given black labor, but the blacks worked for the company. They did not work for, or were not bought by the individual people. They were possession, of a lack of a better word, of the company. And the company promised to finish the fort. How do I make these statements? Well, um, in... Uh, section 15 of that freedom's exemptions, it says, it shall also be permitted that the aforesaid patroons all along the coast of New Netherland and places circumjacent to trade their goods, products of that country, for all sorts of merchandise that may be had there, except beavers, otters, minks, and all other sorts of poultry, which trade alone the company, which means that the company alone reserves the right to trade. You don't get to sell beavers if you come here. That's all the company's money. This is number 30. The company will endeavor to supply the colonists with as many blacks as it possibly can on the conditions hereafter to be made without ever being bound to do so to a greater extent or for a longer time than it shall see fit. I repeat. The company will endeavor to supply the colonists with as many blacks as it possibly can. Ain't that something? The reason that they got New York populated is because they promised these people that they would give them Africans so they could exploit their labor. This is why New York and this metropolitan area gets populated. Because they said, look, we'll give you the blacks to do the work. You just come here and do something. Everybody worked for the company. Those blacks that they gave them um, were possession of the company. Where'd they get the Africans? Let's go back to remember the charter. They were in West Africa. They were in Brazil. They were uh, taking um, Spanish and Portuguese ships. We'll get you as many blacks as you want was one of the things they promised these patroons. And finally, 31, the company promises to finish the fort. The Africans are the one who did that. 
on the island of the Manhattes, which is Manhattan, and to put it in a posture of defense without delay, and to have these freedoms and exemptions approved and confirmed by yada, yada, yada. This is, this is the freedoms and exemptions. You too can find this online with the English um, translation. And don't believe me, look, go right to number 30 and look up where it says that they're promising them these blacks. Let's go on. Huh. A little funny break here. Is Phil Jackson the missing link? Why do I ask that? Well, he won these championships with the Knicks in 70 and 73. Go away so I know I'm correct, please. Yep, 70 and 73. And he also, did you notice, won a championship with a team called the Albany Patroons. Hmm. This is where he won his first championship. See where they get the name from? Patroons, we just show who the patroons were. <laughs> the exploiters of your people and of the land and of the Native Americans. Albany was Rensselaer's town, so they did the country, uh, the team up there and called it the Albany Patroons. And you can see the Dutch clog right here as well, denoting that heritage. A little jokey joke, but I just wanted to put some history. So now if your kids are into basketball or sports and they know about Phil Jackson, you can relate a story. Now you have clues like Knickerbockers and Patroons in order for them to understand this history. This is the flag of Albany. Get it already with the orange, white, and blue? I'm sure. If you look closer at it, you'll see that this is the beaver right here. Chopping down a tree, the beaver's here. So the beavers represented commerce. They were the money. City College, University. Name of their sports team is the City College Beavers. This is that this is that city seal again. You can get a closer look at these two animals right here in the New York City seal beavers. Now, New York is the Empire State and the creme de la creme as far as some people on the planet are concerned. And ask yourself, these things must be really important and vital if they threw two beavers on the city seal to represent the city. Something to think about. Along with that, colonization and exploitation. So, who's this guy? That was a pirate company. This guy, Director General for the WIC. His name is Peter Stuyvesant. He was the longest running leader in New York City history, 1647 to 1664. He ran a trade of Africans in Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, West Indies, and New Amsterdam. Peter Stuyvesant had a peg leg with silver rings. Peter Stuyvesant owned the most Africans in the city. Peter Stuyvesant in 1664 blamed the Africans for the reason that the Dutch lost New York to the British. This is a Peter Stuyvesant statue in the Netherlands with his peg leg. He's a director and in the Netherlands are proud of Peter Stuyvesant. This is the Peter Stuyvesant statue in Aruba because he was director general of Aruba. And you go, you see, I don't want this to come up. You see at the bottom, Peter Stuyvesant, director general von or of New Netherland, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao. Okay, so we got Peter Stuyvesant in Netherlands and Aruba. It's Peter Stuyvesant in Curacao. He used to sit stand at the top of a school, but I think 2015, this statue was taken down, removed because of his racism and his slavery. Because he was director and rule and director for the West India Company of Curacao. This. It's Peter Stuyvesant in New York City, in an area called Stuyvesant Square, close to a place called Stuyvesant Town, New York City. I told you that the leader was a pirate and had a peg leg. Here's the peg leg of Peter Stuyvesant, just like it was on the other statues. He was a pirate and he was a slave trader. How about once again, proving my point about New York City was founded and run by a pirate company and its longest running leader, who not only was a pirate, but had a peg leg 
and was a slave trader. Let's go further. This is Peter Stuyvesant's burial where he actually is, in Stuyvesant Town. He's actually buried in New York City on his Bowery, and Bowery is the Dutch word for farm. So he's buried on a farm that he had. See? Captain General and Governor in Chief of Amsterdam in New Netherlands, now called New York. And the Dutch West India Wards, which were the areas that they had in New York City. Mm -hmm. Even further, Peter Stiver, the the New York City leader, pirate, and slave trader, has so many things named after him. This is a high school in New York called Collegiate. Look at their mascot. The Dutchman, and he has a peg leg. Guess who this is? Peter Stuyvesant. One of the, actually, probably the premier high school in New York City is named Stuyvesant High School. The name is Stuyvesant High School Peg Legs. This is their mascot, or was with their former mascot. Named after the pirate and slave trader with the peg leg, Peter Stuyvesant. How else did they, they big this dude up? Huh? Stuyvesant Town in New York. Bedford Stuyvesant, my home. Brooklyn is named after the slave trading pirate Peter Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant High School, as I mentioned. Upstate New York, there's a Stuyvesant, New York. Here's the street sign in Brooklyn, Stuyvesant Ave. Yes, where they film pause to do the right thing. There also was a Peter Stuyvesant cigarette. Did you know that? And if you looked carefully at the cigarette, guess what the logo is? It's the same logo of the city of New Amsterdam. See the arrow? And look here, there's the beaver right here. There's the three X's on the pack of cigarettes. We worry about Illuminati and all these clues. You know how many clues we're missing right in front of our face about our history? But we're looking on the back of a dollar and all this crazy stuff. Let's go on. Now, let's get, let's get in the nitty gritty. What's evidence? A lot of talking, right? A lot of statues and laws and ordinances of laws and ordinances of New Netherlands, 1638 to 1674. The West Indian Company and colonists kidnapped and brought Africans to New Amsterdam. Yeah, I said it. Let's look what they said in 1655. Whereas the Director General and Council of New Netherlands find that Negroes lately arrived here in the little ship, the white parrot from the Bight of Guinea. Lately arrived, I mean, they're already there, right? Africans being imported into New Netherlands or New Amsterdam. Who's this signed by? Peter Stuyvesant, this guy, right? Let's look further at the note. By a resolution dated November 5th, 19, 1654, the Amsterdam Chamber of the West India Company, right? Proceed with their ship, the White Pert, to the coast of Africa for slaves to dispose of them in New Netherland. Bring that back. Bring it back. <laughs> Run that back. There's a lot more, man. There's a lot more. There's a lot more. There's a lot more. To proceed with their ship, the White Pert, to the coast of Africa for slaves and to discuss, dispose of them in New Netherland and tend to the increase of population and the advancement of said place. We depend on the Africans to increase the population and advancement of said place. Increase the population not to sex, but to encourage people from Europe to come there because you too, remember the promise, will get a black to do your work. Now, what's the last line I'll say? This was the first cargo of slaves imported into New Netherland or the present territory of the state of New York direct from Africa. Into New Netherland, New York. Now, same laws and ordinances, Negroes imported from Africa to New Amsterdam in order to favor this plantation. And you can find this is dated 1652. In order to favor this plantation, the more we hereby consent on a proposal of the inhabitants there that they shall be at liberty to bring in their own ships 
from the coast of Africa as many Negroes as they shall have need of for the cultivation of the soil and that on the conditions and regulations herewith transmitted. You can find that in Laws and Ordinances of New New Netherlands and also in the New York um, Colonial Records. Now, the Colonial Records also say, uh, by which it appears that the merchants of New Amsterdam who were willing, willing to embark in the slave trade were not to go further west on the coast of Africa than Otter or at most. So the West India Company said, yeah, y'all New Netherlanders can go there, but you can't go to the whole coast because we want to make sure we get the best ones to send to Brazil. Now, you have the Negroes thus imported were to be taxed 15 guilders ahead, said duty payable, listen to this, said duty for blacks paid for in tobacco or beaver. They bought our ancestors for beaver fur. Let that sink in. Amsterdam Chamber of the West Indian Company, which had the control of the African trade company that ran New York. Laws and ordinances, once again, this is from 1648. And this is telling you about, uh, I read a little bit. Resolve that private inhabitants of New Netherlands shall be allowed to export their country produce. This is a triangular trade. What did agriculture and suitable duty in their own or chartered ships to Brazil and Angola on these following conditions. First, that the Afro says ships when in Brazil shall not be at liberty to return back with sugars to New Netherland because they wanted all the sugar to go to Europe because sugar was like crack. So no, 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 don't try to take those to New Netherland. All that sugar got to come here. So secondly, that the permit to proceed to Angola shall be granted only provisionally and that for the time that the dispensation shall continue in regard to transportation of slaves, which was accorded on Thursday last. Africans being imported from Angola to New Napoli. This is a letter, once again, showing you how the Jews are even involved in this because it says on, in a letter to Peter Stuyvesant, and whereas some of the Jewish nation of Juan de Leon, Sean, if you're listening, you can look that one up, a colonizer on the aforesaid island of Curacao, here we go, have requested permission to buy and transport to aforesaid island some Negroes who were to come to New Netherland. Jewish slave traders working for the Dutch West India Company. If you really want to study, study Curacao, and you will find many of the Jews there and the ones and descendants of the ones who were slave traders. Here's your primary source for that as well. Let's go on. There's another primary source from the correspondence of, uh, I can't pronounce his name, Simon Lachey, but you can find this. Uh, another less letter to Peter Stuyvesant. What does this one say? It says that it is true that people are busy at The Hague, which is in the Netherlands, to high and mightiness to bring about a general reform on the colonies, and New Netherland would not be forgotten. See? New Netherland, here's a, I'll just give a backstory. New Netherland's bigger thing under Peter Stuyvesant is they were like the little uh, bastard child of uh, exploitation. Brazil was the prize, India with the, with the East India Company. Nobody cared about New, New Netherland. The beavers were cute, but it wasn't the big money maker. The big money maker was the sugar and natural resources. So, you know, it was, and they, they were not allowed for a while to go directly from New Netherland to Africa to get um, Africans. And they kept begging, they kept begging, they wanted to build ships and the whole bit. So finally, as you saw with those letters, the company relented and let them do it. So now they, you know, this was a, the saying, you will not be forgotten. So anyway, a provisional resolution has already been passed that, okay, uh, where do we go from here? They shall be allowed to ship their own products, this is triangular trade, as flour, fishes, meat, bacon, and peas, 
and beans and everything else in their own or chartered bottoms to Brazil and Angola, and that the ships returning may take freight from Brazil, but those coming back from Angola are to bring Negroes to be employed in farming. The orders from the Dutch West Indian Company going to Peter Stuyvesant telling him what you better bring those Africans from Angola to do. We says we too have the right to send a ship to Angola with an assortment of provisions and provides and bring back Negroes from Angola. Let's go on. This is where they were in Angola. <laughs> this is Fort Ardenburg. And they had been fighting with the Portuguese for this fort for a hundred years. And it will go back and forth between the Portuguese and Dutch and what have you. It was named some, uh, something different under the Portuguese. But this is their presence in Angola. This is where they're getting Angolan Africans from. Right here. When it was under the Portuguese, they raided the ships. Pirating. And then they, you know, took over and had a presence in Angola. The Dutch actually have a... Uh, pretty big influence in, had a pretty big influence in uh, Congo and Angola. Not as big as the Portuguese, but it was um, it was pretty big. Huh, what do we have here? We have a primary document. Another one of that same Gideon ship. This is the exact and actual certificate of the ship landing in New Amsterdam from Africa. This is your primary source from Africans being imported into New York. Certificate of the landing at New Amsterdam on the 14th of August of 290 slaves, 153 men, 137 women from the ship Gideon on account of the West India Company. You can find this source at the New York State Archives. It's there. There you go. Here's your proof. But we got a lot more. Now, said so the Africans in New York, right? We just spent the last half an hour, 40 minutes uh, talking. And um, I think this is what the people wanted to come for primarily. But I wanted to give a background on the environment that these Africans uh, step into, the world that they lived in, the economics, and the sort of the moving parts that um, have been going on. This is actually an actual drawing from the uh, was it, 1700s of uh, New Amsterdam. You see New Amsterdam up here? Don't be fooled because there's some tricks to this. This was a generic picture that they had used for, I think, a couple of places. This isn't actually New Amsterdam, but this is what they wanted to do. Because I guess they were lazy and they just put different things in it. Why? I say this because the point of view of where they're standing, if this is New York, yes, this sign is in the way. I don't want to move right now. Then they would have to be standing somewhere outside of Manhattan to look at into Manhattan. But what it does show, if you look at the bottom, look at these figures here. These are Africans who are representative of Africans in New Amsterdam who are being exploited for agriculture. That's who these people are in this picture. And that's what they're supposed to represent. And you can see the man trading some type of skins to this woman for a, a basket of food. Showing you the points of those skins, whether furs or otters or minks or what have you. Right. It's something that people need to jot down as well. I hope people are writing stuff down and I hope. Anyway, the grand design, something you can Google. What is the grand design? The grand design was a plan devised in 1623 by the Dutch West India Company to seize the Portuguese Spanish possessions of Iberian Union in Africa and the Americas to pirate them and to disrupt their business, like I mentioned, in order that the Spanish would not collect enough money for their war against the Netherlands. The plan was to first seize the capital of Brazil, and then the main Portuguese fort in the coast of Angola. And this way, the company would control both the lucrative sugar plantations in Brazil and the Atlantic slave trade. Dutch West India Company. You can find that, you know, start on Google. I mean, start on Wiki and you can grow from there if you really want to get into grand design. Um, but yes, 
That was a part of the grand design. This is why they were pirating and fighting with Portugal, because they were part of a war that was an 80-year war. We're not going to get into that right now. All right. So what do we have here? This is an example of them doing just that. It says the commissioners uh, from the same correspondence book, in 1625 or 1626, African and Atlantic Creole sailors were kidnapped from Spanish ships. Here's an example of them doing just that. So 1653, it is concerning the privateering. Remember that word? Look it up and find out the difference between privateering and pirating. It's just that permission slip. Or sailing by, what did I mention? Letters of mark have made their report and encourage everyone at this juncture in time to equip a ship or ships to inflict damage on the Portuguese. This is a resolution of the West India Company to encourage, quote unquote, privateering. Actual historical document from 1653, them raiding them ships and taking Africans and everything else. Correspondence. 1647 to 1653, you can find it out. So they have a history now of Dutch raiding ships and taking Africans, both free and enslaved, because Africans have been a century in the Americas already, and some of them happen to be free, and some of them happen to be sailors. So when they took a ship, they would take the ones that was in the bottom and chains, as well as the ones who were free and sailors, and they'd sell them as well. This is historically proven by this document and others of what their privateering activities were. So, however, the Negroes captured with the prizes taken at sea may be sent with the knowledge of the government in Brazil to such places as the purchasers choose. However, the Negroes captured with the prizes, the prizes were the Africans already enslaved, I mean, in the chains, the gold and all the other sugar, whatever they found. Who were the Negroes? Those Negroes were those free Africans that was on those ships. They captured, they may be sent to wherever you so want to sell them to. Now, if people want to think about how those first Africans come to Virginia, they come from a Dutch man of war. What is a man of war? It is a battleship, like a privateering ship, because they had taken those first Africans, ended up in Virginia, Anthony Johnson, and others, from Spanish ships. This is why Anthony Johnson's real name is Antonio Negro, because he was a free black. A uh, man under the Spanish realm, whatever you want to call it, who was kidnapped. And so, first 11 Africans of New Amsterdam, the first 11 Africans were brought to New York in 1625 or 1626. We know who they are. I repeat, we know who they are. Prove it. Listen, bro. By the end of this, <laughs> Paulo Angola, Simon Congo, Manuel Garit, Jan Fort Orange, Anthony Portuguese, Clay Antonio, Grazia, Angola. These are some of them. We have their names. Let's look at another example and examine their names further because their names reveal their backgrounds. Paulo Angola, Grazia Angola, the Dutch Fort Portugal for control of Fort Ardenburg in Angola. We talked about that. So they have an influence in the region and they're snatching people from Angola. The other name, Simon Congo, Peter Santome. Sao Tome or San Tome in Congo were controlled by the Dutch and Portuguese. Here's Sao Tome. This arrow is an island off of the west coast of Africa. And here's Congo. These are their names, the first Africans in New York. We know their backgrounds. We know who they are. 
Some of the first 11 Africans were Atlantic Creoles. Yes, Neb, I put it in here. Jan Francisco and Anthony Portuguese fall under that. Now, Atlantic Creole is a term used in North America to describe the charter generations of slaves and indentured workers during the European colonization of the Americas before 1660. These slaves had cultural roots in Africa, Europe, and sometimes the Caribbean. They were of mixed race, not always, primarily descended from European fathers and African mothers. Some had lived and worked in Europe or the Caribbean before coming or being transported to America. They're familiar with this systems that they were in. They knew how to manipulate it. We'll get to that later. Some of these mixed race Atlantic Creoles were culturally what today is called Latino in the United States, as they were descended from Portuguese and Spanish fathers, primarily in the trading ports of West Africa. They had surnames such as Chavez, Rodriguez, Juan Rodriguez, and Francisco. Let's go back up here. Juan Francisco, Anthony Portuguese. So we have Congolese, Angolans, and Atlantic Creoles. But we have a book. This is a very important book. I think people should read it. They want to understand more. Central Africans, Atlantic Creoles, and the Foundation of the Americas. 1585 to 1660. This is by Linda Haywood and John Thornton. Congolese, Angolans, Atlantic Creoles. So the first 11 Africans in New York were owned, quote unquote, by the West India Company. We mentioned that they were not owned or they were not workers of the actual people, but they for the company, not the colonists. They were put to work doing agriculture, the word Bowery, Bowery Street in New York, is Dutch for farm. They worked on the farms and the Boweries. For tobacco, yes, Africans had tobacco farms in New York City. And farming, remember they said they needed the Africans for the agriculture? They also did municipal work in the building of Fort Amsterdam, the building of Wall Street. At Wall Street was actually an actual wall, as well as cutting wood and clearing land, and of course, much, much more. Let's take a look. So here's your primary. One of the New York historical manuscripts, right? It was translated from Dutch. This is Jacob Stoffelson, who was what? Overseer of the Negroes, right? So what does he say? He says, Jacob Stoffelson, well, well, I was an overseer, uh, as, excuse me, was as overseer of the Negroes belonging to the company told you it worked for the company constantly employed with said negroes in the building of fort amsterdam which was completed in the year 1635 also in cutting timber and firewood as well as for the large house as for the guard house splitting rails clearing land burning lime and helping to gather the company's grain in the harvest and consider other such works which we perform with the Negroes, all of which the opponent declares to be true. Done to this bare testimony, 1639. This man who was their overseer has now just told you that those Africans built the fort and basically were all the municipal workers and did the agriculture. Proof, his letter. This is the X mark of Jacob Stoffelson, who was the overseer of the Negroes. This is what they were doing here. This is the proof when we say the Africans built this city and if it wasn't for the Africans, there would be no New York. You would not eat, you would not have defenses and you would not have a colony. Let's go on. There's another one from the Dutch historical records. What does it say? The board of nine, this is from 1652 at Fort Amsterdam. The board of nine men came into the council chamber and requested of the presiding officer, presiding officer that the honorable council please forbid the shooting of hogs on the walls of the fort. Yes, they had animals running wild. So the director general approved the request of the commonality that, and furnished by his own servants or Negroes. And they'll fix the palisades, those are, you know, the beams on the fort and the wall. Now, here's Fort Amsterdam from an actual map um, from the Castile. Is it the Castile? Yeah, this Castile. I'm playing. Um, here's the fort. 
It's Broadway. Is what do we notice here? See this thing right here? This is Wall Street. It was an actual wall on Wall Street that the Africans had to build. Here's a sign if people come to New York and go to Wall Street that'll tell you that this is the site of the Wall of New Amsterdam. In 1653, the city of New Amsterdam erected a wall along the northern edge of town to protect the, 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 the inhabitants from attack. Wall Street had a wall, and it was built by Africans. So when somebody says Africans built Wall Street, pull out these primaries for them. Now, why isn't it here? This is in the way. But the run here says African tobacco farmers in New York City. This is from 1642, and it tells you that on the plantation of Thomas Wall, Paul, excuse me, he shall pay annually as rent of the aforesaid plantation and Negroes 750 pounds of well-inspected tobacco. Do you think that Thomas Hall was the one planting and growing the tobacco? No, it was the Negroes that he had under his work. African tobacco farmers. See how we can make those statements? We use the primary sources. 1647. But in case one or both of those Negroes should happen to die during the lease, the lessee shall receive a rebate for them according to arbitration. So, hey, you lose a nigga, we'll give you some type of uh, discount on it. <laughs> Once again, New York Historical uh, Manuscripts, Dutch, uh, 1638 to 1642. Uh, you can find this. Now, Africans of New Amsterdam live in the town among them. Now, this is an actual map called the Original Dutch West India Grants. You can Google and find that. Um, and this is the fort again. This is the Great Highway or Broadway. And these purple, blue, and yellow things are people's houses. This is all below Wall Street because up until the 1800s, most of New Yorkers lived below Wall Street. But let's take a closer look. Uh oh. When we look closer, we see something called the Negro's house on a map from the 1600s. Negro, guess who lived in this house? The Africans. Aborigines. Nah, we're not doing that tonight. Africans, black folks. This is where they lived. This is where the people who, who were, uh, became servants of the West India Company who were of African descent and African worked. This is downtown below Wall Street. People who are in New York, this is off of uh, Beaver Street. <laughs> Funny enough, off of Beaver Street and Marketfield Street, you find, you're not going to find this building because the streets have changed, but this is where they live in that area. And they live right next to, this is interesting, they live right next to somebody named Abraham Riken. Abraham Riken is the, um, how do you call it, the, the founding father of people named the Riker family. So the Negroes in the 1640s lived next to the founder of the Riker clan. And there was some little discrepancy back here. So this tenuous relationships that Africans and African Americans have with Rikers goes back 400 years but i'll leave that at that for now that's another true story for you okay so the first african women because i only showed you eight men so where the african women come from 1628 the dutch reverend mike calliers bought three angolan women to new amsterdam to be his servants that's how you get the 11. now what is he says he's complaining because his wife died and he has his children so he can't find any good help and what he says he says the Angolan, he says Angolan, the Angola female slaves, he calls them thievish, lazy, and useless trash. I beg your pardon. And here's a Dutch translation right here to the left for people who want to know what it really said. This word right here, the Angolish, Slavenin, that's Angolan slaven. You see? It's the Dutch. This is the English. In both, you see he is very clear on what type of people he has 
and who we have as those African women first introduced. And they were also introduced, if you find the records, for the uh, comfort of the men. This is what they said. Um, and you can find this in the ecclesiastical records of the state of New York. This is the introduction of the first three African women into New York City. This is the primary document for it. 1628. So now we got 11. Those eight, three women make 11. Let's go on. Huh. So now that we have men and women here, they form families. They create history and they have stuff that goes generational. How do we know this? Well, they're your resource and you're welcome for this ahead of time. The New York Genealogical and Biographical Record. You need to get volumes 116, number three, that's to the left, and volume 136, number two, that's to the right. And in these, you will find the genealogy, marriages, and children of many of the first 11 and other free Africans. Some families are traceable for three or more generations. Here are your resources to find out who those people are and their history. Let's look at it. Anthony Portuguese was a slave of the Dutch West Indian Company in New Amsterdam, probably in the late 1620s. He was first mentioned in 1641 and was married in 1646. His wife's name probably was Maria von Angola. They both died probably before 1661. Children, also called Robert, all baptism in New York Dutch Church. Susanna Anthony, right? She died unmarried. Anthony Anthony, twin. He was a twin. Yes, they had twins. Jacob Anthony, he was baptized in 1643. He was married in a Hackensack church. That should give you some clue of what they went to once things started going crazy in New York. Right? Here is Anthony Ford, one of the first 11 Africans in America, in New York. Here's his children. We know him. We know his name, who he married, what his kid's name was. I'm sorry, this got in the way, and I don't want to move right now. Under here, it says Francisco Nigar. You're going to see him a lot in this presentation. He was um, given the land grant in 1662. Um, we know him. We know a lot about him. Um, his land was next to Simon Congo. It's one of his properties. He had many. Jan Primero. He was one of the first. He was one of the Africans there. He has an interesting story, which we'll get to. Great manual, a big manual. We have his story. John of Fort Inch Orange. We got his story. And those books that I gave you have at least 20 other people, their children, and all about them. Peter Santome, a slave of the West Indian Company in the 1620s. He was first mentioned in 1639 and was manumitted in 1644. The name of his wife of children is unknown. He died. But I mean, his wife is unknown, but we know his children. Lucas, this is one of the families that we can trace a whole lot about because there's a lot of success in this family and they're going to come up again in this presentation. Peter San Tome, Sao Tome, the island off of West Africa. Anthony Portuguese, also found as William Anthony's in the records. He was one of those first included in the first multiple manumissions, missions, 1644. His young Francisco, father and son. Um, we know all about him. Uh, we don't need this. Uh, how else do we know about them? Well, they joined the church. First 11 in New Amsterdam joined and were baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church. Where do we find that? In New York Genealogical and Biographical Societies, here's the exact place. Volume 2, Baptisms from 1639 to 1730. This shows the beginnings of the Black community in New York City. Because now we know that they're married together and they're getting baptized. And all this leads to something which we'll get to. Married among each other, Congolese, Angolans, and Atlantic Creoles. And they were godparents for each other's children. Right? And my quote that I like to use, you can see the last one. My seeds marry his seeds. People know where that comes from. That's from Wu-Tang Clan. And this is what these first 11 Africans start to implement. They were marrying amongst each other, and their children were marrying amongst each other, and they became godparents to each other's children, and so forth and so on. How do we know this? 
because we have the actual records from the Dutch Reformed Church. Let's take a look at them. This column right here is Godparents. So Peter St. Anthony's is Domingo Anthony. You see, Jan Francois, it says Nagers or Nagers or Blacks, right? Child Van Camp, Susanna D'Angola, Negrine or Female Negro. Anthony Fernando Portuguese, he was Black, I showed you, right? So they're Godparents to each other's kids. Here's Samuel Angola up here. But they were also smart. They did two things. They didn't just make each other the godparents. They found the uh, white people of influence in the town and made them godparents. Method to the madness. Stay tuned. Emmanuel D'Angola. You see, he's got Marie D'Angola as one of his uh, godparents. John Fort Orange has Simon Congo and Isabella de Angola, their niggers, as you see, I'm not making up the word. That's how they said it in Dutch. John Johann Francisco, remember that name Francisco, we know he's black. And we can see John Primero, Johann Primero is one of his um, godparents. We have more Emmanuel Swagger, Swagger meaning black. He had Francisco Nigar and Grache Negrin. Peter St. Anthony had Gosman de Nigger and Susanna Von Angola as the godparents. Right? Here's more godparents. Look at the Angolas. The Angolas was, was godparenting right and left, taking care of each other's family. Right? So we got more here. All these um, highlight. I won't go through all of them now. But you can see Angola, so just to know Neger, showing you all this, I'm emphasizing those ones in particular to show you the Africans are here. And this is what they're doing. They're marrying each other. They have, they're being exploited for their work. They're getting paid salaries actually too, because they sue for wages at one point. Um, but uh, yeah, we have Clean Anthony, right? Um, who do we have? We have Bastion. We'll get to him. Bastion is going to be very important. We have Emmanuel Swagger. Is that Swagger again? And then bring the um, godparents, Francisco Nigar and uh, Lucretia D'Angola, who was a Negrin or female uh, Negro. There's more from 1645. Um... Here's more from 1646, Philip Swartine, Felipe Swartine, see, black woman, go to the asterisk, showing you African and Vangola, Emmanuel Van Angola here. Okay. Now, why did they do that? Because I know people are like, okay, they got, you know, they did the church and they sold out. Look at why Africans went and got. Christianized and baptized. Read this with me. This is from the Reverend of the Clasons of Amsterdam in 1664. As to baptisms, the Negroes occasionally request that we should baptize their children, but we have refused to do so. Why? Partly on account of their lack of knowledge and of faith, and here we go, partly because of the worldly and perverse aims on the part of the said Negroes. They wanted nothing else and to live to deliver their children from bodily slavery without striving for piety and Christian that virtues. Are we understanding why they did it? Because they knew the world that they were living in. In order you, for you to get free, one thing you definitely had to do was say you was a Christian. And so they couldn't enslave another Christian. So they was trying to get their kids baptized so their kids could be free. And they was trying to get them baptized in the church so they could be free. How do I know this? Because it's coming from the reverends at the time's mouth telling you why these Africans were getting their children baptized and themselves baptized. Do I need to see any more proof? 1664, the reverend telling you, no, they wasn't gung-ho about Jesus 100%, although I'm sure some of them did believe it. They was doing it because it was one as a tool to get free. Hmm? You can find that source in the original narratives of early American history, volume eight. It's from the reverend who was there. 
partly because of the worldly and perverse aims on the part of the said Negroes. They wanted nothing else than to deliver their children from bodily slavery. Let's go on. They also adopted each other's children. This is how they formed that community. And they fought for the children to be free. Now let's read this. This is from Stokes Iconography. William Keefe, who was a director on 1644, Clean Antonio's and his ground beef. This Negro has been identified as Anthony from Angola. Anthony Van Angola, the patentee, was then the widower of Catalina Van Angola, married Lucy Van Angola in a Dutch Reformed church. On on 1643, Dorothy Angola stood godmother for their little son, Anthony. And Anthony and Lucy died soon after, and the child was immediately adopted by Dorothy. Emmanuel and Dorothy petitioned that the child should be declared freeborn. They made a petition, which was granted. Adopting each other's kids, taking care of them, West African traits. They formed a secret society. First 11 New Amsterdam formed a secret society and took a pledge of one for all and all for one. That's a brand new man crow. Ha ha! <laughs> How did they do that? Here is, this is real, just like you think that John, Juan Rodriguez wasn't real and I had to show you. Let's read about the incident of the murder of Jan Primero. See the secret society that I'm talking about. To those who was, this is 1641, to those who were superstitiously disposed and whose anticipation of the future received the coloring from passing events, the year 1641 opened in New Amsterdam with an ill omen. The first month of the new year had not counted many days when the village was thrown into considerable excitement by intelligence that a murder had been committed behind the fort. Six of the company's slaves had perpetrated the horrid deed. A fellow slave was their victim. As there was no evidence, however, against them, torture, the common expedient of the law in such cases, was resorted to for the purpose of extorting self-accusation from the prisoners. But to avoid this terrible engine, the latter confessed they had all... Let me move that. Wait till that moves. Go away. They had all jointly committed the act. They all confessed. The court was in a dilemma. Go away. So making sure it was there. Come on. There you go. The court was in a dilemma. Sweet up here. The company could not afford in the scarcity of laborers to lose six of its Negroes. Just could, justice could not be defrauded. The difficulty was solved by a resolution that lots should be drawn. They had to draw straws in order to determine which of the six should be executed. The lot fell on Manu de rule who was called the giant and he was accordingly sentenced to be hanged here's the great part let's just go away get out of here come on move on the appointed day the village of new amsterdam poured forth its scanty population to witness the execution of the murderer he was placed on a ladder in the fort with two strong halters around his neck the fatal signal was given and the unfortunate man was turned off with horror to relate. Both the ropes broke and the giant fell prostrate to the ground. Forth with the, with the inhabitants and bystanders cried aloud for pardon with great ardor, and so strong were their appeals that the director general granted the culprit his life under a pledge, here right, of future good behavior. That is a 100% Real story. They formed the secret society. Juan Primero went against the grain. He got murdered. And they said, we all did it because they know they couldn't kill all of them. And to make it even more, what the heck, guess who the executioners were during this day and time? Executioners were Africans. So the man in the hood may have been behind this whole thing the whole time. This is an actual story from history. Africans from a secret society in New York and sticking up for each other. This is 1641. You can find that in the history of New Netherland, page 28, 228.
So, manumission or half freedom. 1644, first African in New York petitioned the company for their freedom. They were granted half freedom. This led to first 11 and their families gaining full freedom. So they requested, they got something called half freedom, which we'll examine, which would eventually led to full freedom. So let's get through this. This is an important one. 1644, half freedom. This is um, about we, William Keefe, and the Council of New Netherland, having considered the petition of the Negroes named Paolo Angola, Big Manuel, Little Manuel, Manuel Guru, Simon Congo, Anthony Portuguese, Grazia, Peter Santome, San Francisco, I mean, John, Jan Francisco, Little Anthony, and Jan Fort Orange. This is how we know who they are who have served the company 18 or 19 years. This is why I've put in there that they came in 1625 or 1626 because William Keefe himself could not remember what year they came. So they had been working for the company 18 or 19 years at that point. That's why I say 1625 or 26. To be liberated from their servitude and set at liberty especially as they have been many years in the service of the West India Company here and have been long since promised their freedom. Also that they are burdened with many children, making families, so that it is impossible for them to support their wives and children as they have been accustomed to do if they must continue in the company's service. Therefore, we, the director and council, do release them for the term of their natural lives, the above named, and their wives from slavery, hereby setting them free and at liberty on the same footing as other free people here in New Netherland, where they shall be able to earn their livelihood by agriculture on the land shown and granted to them <laughs> on conditions that they, here's the kicker, this is why I was half freedom, that the above Negroes shall be bound to pay for the freedom they receive. <laughs> Ain't that about something? Each man for himself annually, as long as he lives to the West India Company or deputies here, 30 skeppels of maize or wheat, peas or beans, and <laughs> One fat hog, valued at 20 guilders, which 30 skeppels and the hog, they, the Negroes, each for himself, promises to pay annually, beginning from the date hereof, on pain, if any one of them shall fail to pay the yearly tribute, he, she, shall forfeit his freedom and return back into the said company's slavery. So if you don't give this agriculture, why? Because they needed the agriculture and none of the other Europeans were doing the work. The Dutch folks were there to get the beavers. They wasn't trying to make no farms. So they needed to eat. So they said, okay, we'll free you, but you're gonna have to give us back something. So we're gonna put a tax on your freedom. You have to give us back this agriculture and this fat hog every year. So with the express condition that their children at present born or yet to be born shall be bound and obligated to serve the company as slaves. So they were given half freedom and children will still remain slaves. <laughs> Africans wasn't going for that though. Likewise, that the above mentioned shall be obliged to serve the West Indian company here by water or on land where their services are required on receiving fair wages from the company. This was done February 24th, 1644, in Fort Amsterdam, in New Netherland. You can find that in the Laws and Ordinances of New Netherland, 1638, 1674, page 36 to 37. These are how they get, this is how they get free. Now you see it. But this is only half free. Here is an actual manumission certificate that you can find in New York State Archives. This actual one is from Domingo Anthony and his wife, late slaves in the company service. Uh, so this is manumission. And then here is where they've been given half liberty. This is another group of, of Africans, 1663, where you're getting half liberty. 
You can find this in the New York State Archives. And then what do we also find? Huh. Then they get full freedom because they kept petitioning and kept fighting. We don't want to be just half free and we want our children to be free. So 1664, that same group from the last um, image, they get their certificate. See, name is 1660, whatever, have been made fully emancipated and made free. See the steps? Manumission, get some half freedom, then we gotta find a way to get our kids free, and we petition and fight for full freedom. Foundations of the black community in New York City and in America. Now, land of the blacks. Now that we're free, we got a family. Where are we gonna live? Land of the backs. Here is an actual, actual land grant of land being awarded to Big Manual. Remember the one that was about to be Sorry, hung? I'm not sure. Listen, um, computer, I'm on, I'm actually doing some right now. So this is the actual land grant. Actual. You see? And we notice because his land got inherited by his children. Big Manuel, once he passed, his land went to his wife and children. So the land that they received was inheritable. And here's the actual one. Now you get that. This is in the Mark Mitchell collection. It's interesting because Mark Mitchell is a white guy, but he owns so much of African and African-American history. And we need to fight to try to uh, be able to purchase and buy some of our history as well. Anyway, he owns this document. This is an actual document, 1667, written by the English governor. Honor. This is a letter of Mark right here, by the way. See the seal? That's what I was talking about. Make that with the burning candle wax. So these are the two. This is the book that you may want to take a look at to, to see some of the information I'm about to present in the next slides. This is the, for researchers and for historians, as far as New York is concerned, this is probably the premier uh, book or set of books that you can get regarding the history of New York. Um, it's called Stokes Iconography of Manhattan. And this too is a gift for you. It's available free online, all, what is it? Six or seven volumes. So here's the land of the blacks. They took over um, farms that they had worked on for years. The farms were called Bowery's. So these Bowery's is what they took over because they had been living there and they were granted these lands. And so what I point out here is I'm showing you one. This is the land. This is a, this is the land grants superimposed over a map of, of that street grid at the time. So you can show you the, the general areas where these people live. So this is Paulo Angola. You can see 1645. Yeah, this is that Smith Hill farm. This is Domingo An Anthony. He was, this is the grant, this is, see, this is off of Bowery Street, Bowery being farm. This is the farms that they worked on. This is where Catalina Anthony lived off of Hester Street, for those who are familiar with um, New York City. And those visiting, I'll tell you that this is all African land. You can see it now, all right? Um, we have Domingo Anthony's property here. You get a closer view. He's off of Bayard and Mulberry Street. This is the actual grant right here. Domingo Anthony, 1643. This is where it's located in Albany. And tell you, you see? What do we have next? This is Greenwich Village. This is Washington Square Park right here. Anthony Portuguese's property. West 4th Street. Here's something called the Negro's Causeway, which is the waterway that they use that ran through all their property. This is Paulo Angola's property on West 3rd and McDougal Street, right in the heart of Greenwich Village. People know West 4th Street basketball. It's on this corner. No, it's on this corner down here, which is also land, but this, this is Washington Square Park where people know. This is, Anthony, this is African land. This is the land of the facts. Why? Here's the thing right here. The farm at the Negro's Causeway, which is this, you know, King's Farm called the Negro's Farm, called the Negro's Farm, right? It says near the Bowie, commonly called and known by the name of the Negro's KG, and they spelled it wrong. This is supposed to be Causeway right here. That's this waterway. 
The Negroes Causeway so-called skirted the edge of the crippled bush along Mineta Water. This is why you have Mineta Lane right here. We'll see this in a better picture because this waterway goes through there, right? And it said that part of Mineta Street between Bleecker and Mineta Lane was part of the old way to get out or which way you can get out from the water. William Keefe to Paola and Dangola, a free Negro, 1644. And we look on the map, Paolo D'Angola, December 30th, 1644. He got his land, McDougal, West Third, in the heart of Greenwich Village, which is the call the land of the Blacks. This is Catalina Anthony's property, same deal. You see the actual grant, you see it on the map. Off of Bowery Street, Bowery means farm once again. Okay, this is Bowery, you see? This was called the Negro's Lots. We're not making up terms, this is what they call them. These are the Negro's Lots right here. And this is along here, you got Anthony Congo lived here. Christopher Santa May lived here. Manuel Garit lived here. You can't really see right here, but um, I should have, I didn't put the arrows on this one. This is Manuel the Spaniard lived here. Uh, Lucas Peters, we'll see him in a bit, lived here. Manuel Garit here. You see? All these rats, these are all their property. Anthony Congo, that name is pretty clear there. This is the land they granted. Yes, we owned. Greenwich Village. The people see it now. It's not just words. <laughs> Let's go. More of the village. Bowery Street, Anthony Congo. You see what's up right here? Keith to Yon Negro. This is, the, this is the area of the Negro tobacco farms. Yes, Africans had tobacco farms. Bastion. Captain of the Negroes. He had a name of Captain of the Negroes. We'll get to that in a second. It's another story for you. It's the actual mansion house plot. This was the mansion house plot that they got. Anthony Congo, ground brief 1647. Anthony Congo, Anthony Congo, March 26, 1647. Right there. Mansion house plot was a part of a 40-acre tract originally granted to who? Three Free Negroes. Land of the Blacks more. It was called Northwick. I showed you that map in Amsterdam. This area was called Northwick or Northwood. Because it was north of Wall Street. Because everybody lived below Wall Street. And we can see it all in here. Paulo D'Angola, Simon Congo lived next to Peter Santome. Here's that Manetta Lane. That we were talking about his West 4th Street, his Negroes Causeway. This is the land of the blacks, Greenwich Village. Now, modern day, you can see it, and I just put it small in the corner. You see, Bleaker, his Manetta Lane, NYU's properties there, his Washington Square Park. All of this is land of the blacks. This is all ours. NYU's property, Washington Square Park. See, McDougal Street. When you come to New York, people will go to the village, you'll see these places. <laughs> people in New York should be like, oh snap, but who knows? Anyway, here we go. Here's Land of the Blacks on Northwood, Greenwich Village. And I put it here to show you. You see, Negroes Causeway, Washington Square Park, all that jazz, Washington Square Park, Water ran through here, Simon's Promos, Congo's property, and Palo Angola, and then his Bowery. Get closer. There's Bowery, which means f Dutch, farm in Dutch. Somebody should look it up. See? So they live all in here. West Third, Broadway Lafayette, all that property, Long Bowery, along, excuse me, Long Bowery, and then this way as well. Now, I said they formed the black militia. Here's my evidence. Africans in New York have found the black militia. So you have Bastion, who's captain of the name Blacks. Where do you get captain from? Captain is a military position, unless 
Damn, yeah, man, I won't say it. But anyway, captain is a military position. Peter Tambor is a drummer. Manual trumpeter is a trumpeter. If you know anything about militia units, especially from around this time, you need a captain, you need a drummer, and a trumpeter. And for the most part, when they put the Africans into militias, we had we were the instrument players because we were actually, obviously, the musicians and good with drummings. And drumming would um, uh, have you make military formations. So what do you mean? Look at the baptism records. Peter Van Kamp, Tambor, and it has that cross symbol. So that we go down to the legend and see what Tambor is. And it tells you once this thing disappears, that Tambor... That tambour means drummer. Come on, go away. You see? In the red at the bottom, drummer. Here's Emmanuel Trumpeter right here. Trumpeter. And then we go back to those same baptismal records. I said Captain of the Blacks, and you probably were like, yeah, you're crazy. Bastion, Captain Von de Swarton with the cross. We go to the legend, and it says Captain of the Blacks, and in parentheses, free Negro. Captain Black Militia. This is the 1640s in New York. Free Black Militia. Explain that. More proof. We also fought in the militias with the Europeans. Bushwick and Muster Roll of 1663. You're going to find two names amongst the Europeans. You might think the Europeans are spelled wrong. The last names are Francisco de Meyer and Anton de Meyer. They're actually misprints or misreadings from Dutch documents. Those two names are Francisco de Negar, and get this, Antoine, Antoine de Meyer actually is Antoine de Moore. I'll pause this page because I know people are going to be like, that doesn't say that. Go ask any expert in this field where those misprints, and they will tell you exactly what I told you, that that is Francisco Negar and Antoine de Moore. I'll give you the people. Charles Garing is the head and probably the leading expert in this area. Russell Shorter wrote the book, Island at the Center of the World, and other books on this topic. Dennis Maker is another one from the, uh, what is it, the New Gotham uh, Society. Right, contact the New Amsterdam Society. Contact the Dutch Embassy if you want to, and they're gonna tell you the same thing I told you. That's Francisco Niga and Antoine Moore on the Bushwick Muster Roll. And as you can see, they also have a drummer, because drummers were important, like I told you, and they also have a captain. We had our own militia, and we were part of theirs as well. You can find that in the history of the town of Bushwick, Kings County. Guess what? Francisco and the guard tell you he's going to come up again. Founder of Bushwick, Brooklyn. Founder? Yes. Town of Bushwick, Brooklyn, 1661. Here's the application and the people who received the patent. Whose name is that right there? Did a black man find Bushwick, Brooklyn? Yes, he did. Does it sound so crazy anymore? No, it doesn't. Why? Because you have the proof and you have his name. And if you want, you can get that in that same history of the town of Bushwick and turn to page eight, I believe, and you will see Francisco Nigar on the patent for Bushwick, Brooklyn in 1661. These are the original Dutch um, towns in Brooklyn. All my Brooklyn heads might appreciate this. The original town was Bushwick. It was actually a town called Brooklyn. Uh, was it New Utrecht, Gravesend, Flatlands? <laughs> These are the original towns. And Francisco Nigar is founder of Bushwick. Black man. Fact. Primary. Let's go. Now, oh, at the end already, I got through them. This is the one I wanted to leave you with because this is amazing to me. Lucas Peterson, who comes from that Peter Santa May line, I spelled his name wrong, I apologize, it's Peters, um, was a barber surgeon, which means that he was a surgeon. Because the barber surgeon was the first name. How do I know that? Am I making that one up? No. Go to, his, go to that same book. What does it say right here? When he, the land grants. These two Negroes, Lucas and Solomon Peters, became well known in the colony. Lucas was a physician. This is the 1600s. 
1640s and 1650s. How come we never heard that we had a position that was well, physician that was well known in the county of New York? And he was black. And his father and his three generations. I don't understand. If people don't find his mind blowing, like, I don't know what else I could do for y'all. Why didn't they tell us this? Oh, you want further proof? I'm going to end it with this one. I told you he was a surgeon. It's the first hospital in New York. First hospital in the United States was erected on Manhattan Island about 1663 when Lucas was around at the request of the surgeon Heinrich Varinger. What was it for? It was the hospital for the West India Company's Negroes. Guess who was a surgeon, more than likely, at the first hospital in the United States? Lucas Peters. You can find that in the Catholic Encyclopedia talking about this. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bring that back. <laughs> we need to know this God name. He need to be next to him. That's my last slide, so I can go back now. I'm no, 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 no. <laughs> we need to know that guy like we know him. Bring you. him back. His name is Lucas Peter. I can change it now. I'll change it for you right in front of you. You can see his name is Lucas Peters. His, his father, Peter Santome. And this is his property over here on that same map. Lucas Peters, he got property. Okay. And with that said, um, that is the end of my presentation. I hope you've learned at least one thing you haven't before. And if there was any questions, Alan, now you can ask. Yeah, I didn't see none, but if I got any questions, put them up in the chat, man. And if somebody want to come on and build, you know what I'm saying, and talk about what you learned today, let us know. We put the link in, give y'all a couple of minutes and to build on it. Say what? What happened? What did you say? Any questions? No, nah, ain't no questions yet. Ain't no questions in here yet. How is it not? I don't understand. Yo, I, these are the no, 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 no. People, people was building and said Nev was answering mad questions in the back. Oh, okay. So well, we want y'all to, to recognize Lucas Peters. Put his name next to M Hotel when you think about medicine, baby. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I'm here. I'm I'm, I'm oh. waiting. Right? I'm yeah, here. Maybe. We, we looking so so basically we just want to let y'all know uh we're trying to start something. We about to do something that's real big. Can't reveal it now, but y'all gonna see. But the objective is or one of the objectives that we can tell you about is this gotta be done in every single city. Wait, hold on. I like wait, let me say this before you go into your thing. Um, could you please I hate the can people like the video so it could be spread around, please? I mean, that's the least you could do. I, I would appreciate that. Could you subscribe to the channel if you haven't? I mean, I, 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 I don't, you know, I'm trying my best for people to present and get them. Wait, uh, you got to say it again. What was the question? You got to come to the phone, but I think the question was... You sound, you sound far away, man. What year did the Dutch um, the, start bringing Africans to America? Well, we have them because they bring, they bring them prior to them coming to New York. They bring them to Virginia. Look at the story from Virginia. Those, those Africans came to Virginia to the English through a Dutch man of war. That's a Dutch warship that had been pirating Spanish and Portuguese ships that had Africans. And in order to go home, so they would go on pirate ships. They'd take these Africans. they sell who they could in Brazil. I'm sorry to inform you, but the ones that they couldn't sell, they would bring to the East Coast and sell them for food so they can make a return trip back to Europe. That's why the numbers are so low. It wasn't a whole industry yet. They were called, sorry to tell you, refuse slaves. That's it. Any more questions? Come on, man. No more questions, man.
Well, we encourage y'all to look at the cities you live in and go look at those markers, man. Go go read about your city and read that story. Cause we well, have now it's all out there in the world. This information, most of it, most people have not heard before. And you can go ask the experts. None of it has been located in one particular area. All that put these from hundreds of documents. This is the first time that you find it in one place. I'm not saying that to be arrogant, it's the truth. And I and I ask you to please go and ask the experts in the field. I provided their name a number of times. And also there's a number of back ones. Here's the back ones. Craig Stephen Wilder, um, Leslie Alexander, Leslie Harris, and my teacher, Professor Robert J. Swan, as well as Carla Peterson, these are all black folks and people who are experts in this area and give them this video and have them vet the work and then go and give it to your kids, history teachers and have them vet it and then go and give it to your college professors and then have them vet it. This is an open challenge. And when they find mistakes or lies, you contact me. But if they haven't, then what you need to suggest is they need to teach it and put it into the children's history books. That's the challenge from now on. If people want to challenge uh, the institution, academia, take this and give it to them. Ain't nothing else to say after <laughs> that. We post videos more often. <laughs> we, we do post videos, bro. No, no, no. I want this out there. And I, and I mean this, man. Like, take this to your teachers, uh, whoever, and have them vet it. Yeah, yeah, we can. I mean, it. I put every document in there, had them, I gave you all the references. You go look at it. You yeah, tell me Juan Rodriguez's story is fake. You tell me the big manual story is fake. You tell me they didn't own this property in the village. Stop him it when you say this confident now that what you're saying is the truth because you got the primaries now good work bro good work man. hold up man we ain't done yet man let's talk about negro dutch nah nah i ain't getting all that so I, ain't, I ain't giving us no that was a nice university slide, lecture right there. Yeah, that was a nice a lecture slide, they good that was for tell you that was for you and mbk i used to love that one right you got story now right. you got the whole thing thank you <laughs> My God, <laughs> he was dropping bombs yeah. in that piece. <laughs> J- Jehudi, all, all you got to do, Jehudi, is say all praise due to Rob Bourne. I don't gotta say we nothing. Gotta run that you back. know exactly what I'm talking about, bro. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about, bro. <laughs> I gotta watch oh, this I'm again tonight. The information is laid out there for you. I'm available for questions. I would, you know, I'm, I'm open to be with anybody. I would really rather and. If you have your children that are high school or whatever, doing this work, and you know, reach out, man. Change the books. I'm just flapjacking and arguing with this information. If you're standing on truth, go and challenge the system and change the books. Get these stories added to the books. Be confident in knowing that the first resident of the major, most major city in the world was your people. Why is it missing? Why is it missing? I gave you the primaries. They got the same. Those are Dutch records. They're sitting in, in Holland somewhere. Chilling. You got the primaries now. I gave you. Go get the book. How many people went and got the book already? I told you it was free online. I give you. I give it away. Google the name. You see the same images. You see the same story. I didn't make it up. Yeah, they give them books away. I didn't make up the Dutch historical baptism records. I didn't make up the, people who want to holler about genealogy. I gave it the genealogy. Here you go. You want shit? I gave you the shit. You, you wanted to question why they would go to the church? Did I not prove my case now? Why they went to church? We talked about this before, too, so it shouldn't be. No, 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 no. There's no more talking. I gave you the reference. We just showed it to you. Here's the reference. Because they are, they have ill designs of trying to make their children free. That's why they're trying to get in church and baptized. They ain't thinking about no sweet baby Jesus. Nigga trying to get free. You know, broke down the colors, the basketball teams, everything. 
I put this in certain people DMs who talk to me, put them in. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to call. I could tell from the numbers that there was a bunch of people watching. And after a couple of minutes, they couldn't take it. Their souls started hurting. They'd be like, damn, I'm not even getting involved in this. I'm yes. not- Wait, hold on. Somebody says black movement media. Yes, this is yeah. I'm, this is the question. I mean, if there's a question, is it slave uh, trade? Or he, 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 no, slave trade. Or else is relevant to this? America, North America. That's what he's asking. He's been asking it for the past hour. What was it? He's been asking about the number of Africans that came to North America via the slave trade. When? Through the whole yeah. time? Through the whole time. He didn't give a specific date, but that's what it he's was asking. Roughly 12 million. Next question. It's roughly 12 yeah. million. The <laughs> least, it, 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 the a, least, wait, hold on. The least came to America proper on the 50 state. The least. Indeed. Also into the Caribbean in Brazil. I mean, if you look on our yeah. channel, that's why I told you, brother, just look on the channel. So the, the question y'all have is, how the hell did the slave population jump to 4 million in 1860 when only four to 500,000 people came there? We All right, not, this is not that. This is not, no, this I know, is, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just trying uh-uh. to say it's right. I'm just, that, that's it. So you can look at the video. Yeah, we talked so we about got the, We got the sources of slave breeding. Thomas Jefferson talking about national increase and all that. So this video, my brother, is about the specific topic of the Africans here. That's it. Because we have a big thing going on with people saying no Africans came here. No, blood no, 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 no. I'm not doing that right now. Nah, I don't care. Doing I don't that, care bro. Hold what on, people bro. are saying. Wait a minute. Hold on, man. Wait a minute. We just answered the question. This, we got to get this out. Because if, if you sit back, my brother, go back, look at the video, look at the seals, and look at the primaries, man, and debate the primaries. Don't talk to us no more. We're not talking to y'all no more. This is the last time, man. Oh, you ain't getting this no more. That's it. It's over. It's done. Everything's information after this, bro. We're not talking. If you serious challenge academia, like my brother said, man. That's my open challenge. Any, I promise, and I mean this in the bottom of my heart. Take you this. You ain't video. serious trying to and argue everybody don't. down on YouTube, man. Cut it out. Ain't no arguing with these primaries, so you might as well hang it up anyway. Yeah, we, that's not why we're here. We're not here for that. We're not going back and forth. Go back and forth um, and eat, cl- eat classic records. So I ask please to, you know, share this video with your kid. I tried to make it, you know, engaging and add stuff like the Knicks or whatever, just so you can, you know, stuff that's relatable to, to the youth. So they can understand the story. You don't have to get into all specifics. They have visual clues around them to remind them of the story. This is why I build these presentations in that manner. So it's not towards you old honorary Negroes. It's to your kids and to the children who's going to take up the mantle and keep pushing it forward and challenge their teachers because we're too busy trying to challenge each other and maybe the children to take up the mantle and actually challenge the system so we can change things. Yeah, that's the end game. You guys keep putting Africans on everybody. You see, this is the ignorance that I'm talking about. I didn't mention that about everybody. I'm showing you the ones that's there. Right. They don't have to be you or anything else. Wrong guys. We've already addressed. What yeah, we've I'm not about. saying if you was not African, this isn't for you. It's simple as that. There's no other way I can put it. If you're not African, you're not interested in the story of the African. This isn't for you. If you're we Indian, already go and tell stuff. your story. I have no problem with that. If you're Chinese, and tell your story. If you're Irish, do the same. <laughs> so the Africans and the descendants of the Africans who are in America at this point. And what do you what do you call them? Black is too. It's not you got to <laughs> you got to be more specific than that, man. I mean, we define black in the last bill. My name is my name. We've already described what black means, but we mean what black means. If you listen, listen to somebody with some. <laughs> What I'm not going to do is I'm not I'm not I'm not cheating what I've done with this nonsense. I have spent weeks putting in, in years of research. Right after that mind blowing presentation, you come in with this nonsense. I'm not doing that, man. It's disrespectful toward me. That's the best I gotta, 
I got to, I got to, I'm sorry, I got to draw the line somewhere, man. If there's nothing intellectually engaging, I'm not wasting my time. Man, I, right now, I'm crazy. I'm not playing this silly game, man. Amazing. I, I laid out all the sources. I didn't hide a thing. I showed you map and the source and the book. This. Don't believe me. Go get it. Hit rewind and get busy. Wait, I gotta read. I gotta read a book. Yeah, we got we got one walk and tall. Uh, actually, three of them. But it's coming, bro. Just keep your eyes open, man. It's coming, man. Everything in there, I intentionally put the primary source for it. What else do you want? Yeah, well, I'm looking. At, I'm looking in the chat right listen. now. I'm trying to see if there any. You know what I mean? Yeah, honest, yeah. I'll let me know. Honest you questions know. in there. Appreciate everyone for coming through, checking out the show. Like, share, and subscribe. Yeah, yeah, seriously, please. What we watch, leave comments, leave questions. Please share the clip. I'm asking everybody out there, do you have your New York history now? You have it now. And then we will do other places, but I had to start with New York because that's where I'm from, Don. And the stories there are amazing and they've been lost to history. That's right, Snap. Man, what Danny said a long time ago. I don't ago. care what he said. And I, I got tell, I, I would tell it you. It wasn't again. New York black that made Harlem Harlem. No, no, no. I think oh, black peace thing. Not now this guy black peace thing. I'm an angry. Oh, I'm not angry. Yeah, I'm just saying. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate anybody listening. Yo, 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 check it out, Steph. Real talk. I'm gonna tell, tell, tell you this. I'm gonna tell you this one more time, Steph. I'm gonna put it in the chat again. I'm gonna put it in the chat one more time. No, no, so you can no. We live out. now, so we gonna have to deal with this right now. Before no, I put it in the live chat. Nah, yo, nah. We gonna deal with brother, this right now. Brother True Story has already said that it was the people that, from the that, south. That's cool, but now you got to deal with just like in Kim. All right, all right. The people don't want to hear this. No, don't cut this off. Don't cut it off. I'm leaving. Shots fired. I want to go. And it took the south. Get me a little taste, just like in Canada. Great All right. presentation, yeah, brother. Listen, 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 yo, yo, listen. I'm about to stop the broadcast. No, we can do no, this. stop the broadcast, man. We having fun, man. We, this is what, so we know that we not crazy. Yo, like, Alan, you are gonna end, yeah, All this is gonna be on the end of the video. We gotta cut that. Cut this off okay. right here. Yeah. Yeah. Right, cut this part right, off. All right. Right. So, well, let me just say this. Let me get my little closing here. I really do appreciate everybody. Again. This couple of hours um, to watch. I do hope you at least learn one thing you did not know before. And if you do find this information factual, put it forward and stand on it. Don't be scared to challenge hold on, hold on, the system hold on, hold on, hold on. now that you have the facts. We got a good question. Did the, What's um, the question? I got it. It said when the British took over in 1664, did they acknowledge the free Negroes? Oh, that great question. So let me go back real quick. I don't want to really show my screen. But yes, that's why I showed that uh, certificate from um, Richard Nichols to Big Manual. So they honored the grants that they had. But the problem was the Royal Africa Company was putting a lot of pressure on people. So a lot of the rights had started getting taken away. And so they began to move from that area to um, tap in into uh, West New York. That they moved to Parson, New Jersey, and Hackensack. Hey, bro, why did they call it the land of the blacks? Because it was black people there. I mean, <laughs> that's a great question, but I'm not trying to be funny, but that's why. It was called the Negro Farms. It was called the Negro Lots. The Dutch part of the area was called Northwick, like I mentioned, and they, and, um, but on the documents, like I showed you the original grant, they refer to it as Negro Lot, Negro Farms, and the Land of the Blacks. The river right there was called the Negro's Causeway. Somebody said, why we don't get a notice when y'all go live? I don't know, brother. They yeah, the yeah if you want to notice when we go live, hit that bell beside the nah, subscribe yeah. block. I, I definitely say you, you hit the bell. You got, I don't hit that when bell, we go live, you'll get notifications. Maybe we've been sabotaged.
And again, I'm not doing that with these guys. Never mind. They call them Negroes or colored, not Africans. Actually, they did not call them colored. We called ourselves colored. They did call them Negroes, and they did not have to call them Africans because I went through a point of showing you their names were Angola, Congo, and Tome, and then I specifically showed you where Angola, Congo, and San Tome are. They did not need to call them people Africans where Angola, San Tome, and Congo are in Africa. Is that understood? Uh, we might want to. Let's do an after show hangout, man. We were messing up the first build. He's crazy. All right, yeah, we can cut this. Yeah. All right, cool. So thanks once again. Please like and share this video and um, watch it with your kids. And um, like I said, I hope you learned one thing you didn't know before.